Welcome to episode 4 of Fascinating, a Star Trek podcast, The Naked Time. In this week's episode, a careless officer breaks protocol during an away mission, leading to the Enterprise crew becoming infected with an unidentified illness. The condition causes peculiar behaviours, and one afflicted officer commandeers the ship. With the planet below beginning to break up, Kirk must regain control and execute an untested theoretical manoeuvre to save the ship and the crew before it's too late. I am in control of my emotions. Control. Good afternoon, Ian. Are you in control of your emotions? Usually. It depends if you're half naked or not. Well, if it is naked time, then things can be uncomfortable. It's always naked time in this podcast. Well, leave that to people's imaginations. Yeah. How are you? I'm not too bad, Jerry. I've not got any unusual sweaty palms or anything this week. How about you? Yeah, just the usual sweaty bits. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> are you pleased to see the usual crew show back up in this episode? I am, yes. It was a, an interesting episode. Quite a, a fun one, I thought. Ridiculous. It had its, its silly moments. A bit of insight as well into some of the emotions and thoughts, feelings of the crew that we've not been made aware of up to this point. Absolutely. So a few things we can chew over. There are. Quick reminders, probably one of the last times I'll remind folk about this, but we're watching Please. Netflix versions in air date order, so it's remastered and we didn't do the cage, but we might come back to it, you never know. You never know. That'll keep people satisfied for now, oh, I think. On the edge of their seat. If they want to find out what we're up to, we're always on social media. We're at Trek Podcast on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We've also got our YouTube channel up and running with all the episodes as they come out. And on the website, we're at com. No excuse not to listen or to interact. Yeah, chip in with your views on the episodes, what you like, what you don't like, what you remember from watching them and the 60s if you watched them in the 60s or whenever you first watched them yeah. all these things are great answer some questions some of my questions i've got plenty for one we were told in charlie x i think the crew was 428 something along those Kirk lines loses an awful lot of his crew i mean there was what 11 espers died uh, last week with kelso as well tormelon dies yeah um it's like cabot cove a little bit, but I suppose there's a certain rate expected when you're in a military ship. Yeah, occasional from natural causes. <laughs> One every now and again. He's losing like nine and eleven and six people at a time. Well, they get attacked by aliens in the first episode. I assume that some of the hardcore trekkers keep a tally of this and they can tell you exactly how many people are on board. 100% they can. Yeah. I'm not one of those people, but 100%. I assume that they add to the crew over time as well, or maybe yeah, they'll replenish from star bases or other ships. I'd imagine, as required. Okay, We've got a new nurse this week. We have. I assume he she's here for the long haul. Well, I'll tell you about that later on. <laughs> we start with a, a captain's log, as we always do, or what? up to this point, we always do. What's the star date? The star. There isn't a star date. No, that's not a star date. Try to catch me out there. Eh? <laughs> But we find out they're orbiting, is it Psy? Psy 2000. That's it. An ancient, dying, frozen wasteland with the objective of picking up a scientific party and then observing the imminent destruction of the planet. They're cutting it a bit fine, aren't they? Very fine. The destruction, the, the dying of a planet, I'd imagine you measure in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. Yeah. You don't turn up 24 <laughs> hours before. You can imagine the science crew for the last 10 years have been sending emails, urgent, when are we getting collected? <laughs> yeah. Please come. It's like, well, it's okay, we've got ah, 48 hours, yeah, it's fine. They're leaving it to the, literally to the last few minutes. <laughs> it's like a James Bond, you know, like the, the, the bomb counting down. Yes, wait till the, the timer finger. gets to one before you yeah. cut the wire. That's it. <laughs> Nonsense. It keeps things tense. It does. So we're on this planet. It's like a, a frozen Pompeii. A little bit like that. There's people in situ. They have. They've died in the middle of going about their, their lives, working and showering. Maybe not their normal lives. I think they've all went a bit mad. It does seem that way. One of them's got a 
Fraser, I think, when I was in the shower with their clothes on. And what, you don't shower with your clothes on? Not every time. Only in public when you're a little bit embarrassed. Yeah, yeah. I always keep my clothes on. Well, that, that's sensible in mm. those circumstances, obviously. Who doesn't? What I want to know is why the first place spot checked was the shower. <laughs> To see if you can Hang on, <laughs> let's go and see if there's any naked people <laughs> through this room. Spock's raging that he can't get to murder anyone this week. It's oh, they're dead already. That's disappointing. Ah. They're wearing shower curtains for some reason, Spock and this other guy. Yeah, we find that his name is Tor Mullen. Yes, they've, the two of them have been down alone to recover this party. So they haven't been communicating with these scientists, obviously. Yeah, they're wearing some red suits. They waited till they got there to beam down and find that they were dead. They didn't like email in advance or phone them. Yeah, surely just before you, at least just before you beam down, you communicate and say, right, we're on our way. So yeah. you get a cup of tea or something ready. Yeah, get the kids on. Yeah. But no. No, no. And less of, mm, less of, no, we weren't. There was no introduction saying that, you know, we've lost communications or yeah. anything like that. That could have been in the captain's log. It could have been, yes. And I've got issues with the captain's log again. I think you brought it up in the first episode. It seems to be sometimes ret uh, retroactively. Yeah, there's written. one later on where he seems to talk about knowing about this illness without yeah. the fact that they actually do know about it. So what's happened? Mm. In any case, when they're down there, they confirm that all life systems have been turned off as they discover the body of a strangled woman. Yes, and Tormolan has an itchy nose. So what does he do? Takes his safety gear off, obviously. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> There's no suspicious circumstances no. here. I mean, it was a it's, it was a health and safety gone mad that you have to wear these suits in the first place. Absolutely. <laughs> so he takes his glove off and he doesn't put it back on. Not immediately. No, he sticks his hand under this desk and we see some blood, it looks like, oozing from something. It's something anyway, mm. and... I think when he feels it touch him, it's, it's maybe like cold to the touch. Mm -hmm. So he puts his glove back on, just as Spock comes through and says, make sure you don't take your gloves off. Yeah. Well, it's not that he touches it. I think he puts his hand under it and it, it migrates it, towards yes, it. Yes, but he feels that and he puts his glove back on just in time to pretend he'd never taken it off. Yeah. <laughs> really, he's, he deserves all he gets here, Tormelon. Taking it off and then saying, ah, but there's no point in me saying anything here. I'll just... Uh, Keep quiet about it. What's yeah. the worst that can happen? I mean, if you're being charitable, maybe you assume that when he's being um, put through his decontamination, he does say, oh, I had my glove off for a moment. Mm -hmm. But there's no on-screen confirmation of that. No. Spock then communicates with Kirk in the Enterprise and briefs him on what they've found. He also tells him it's like nothing they have dealt with before. I find that hard to believe. It's quite similar to a lot of things. Yeah, it's a bit of a leap there, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, nothing like this has ever happened anywhere. Are you sure, Spock? Probably. <laughs> we get the credits. And then the traditional captain's log with a, a star date. What was it? Probably something rub 1704.2, something like something that. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Probably. I didn't check this week. Yeah. Yeah. And this summarises what we have just seen and it reconfirms their mission. Yeah. Waste of time. Again, for folk who haven't watched the first part there. Every time you get a captain's log, it's like, what have I missed? Yeah. Let's just play the captain's logs. We are now in the transporter room. Spock and Tormolin beam back up and Spock makes sure that Scotty decontaminates them. Now, this, this is very convenient. We don't see this every time. No, but there was the exposure to this unknown planet or okay we don't know what's happened to in, people, so. um the what was the first episode man trap man trap yeah so down then there was all people were dying they thought they'd eaten plants or whatever yeah, but they beamed were, up but like yeah, yeah and, they, and they beamed up the bodies and they beamed up the, and they didn't decontaminate they weren't interested then they probably just did it off screen when we didn't see probably yeah <laughs> okay plus that was kirk he doesn't need to be decontaminated no as captain he's immune yeah so anyway they're they're decontaminated in the transporter room and Kirk instructs him to get medicine to look at them both. Yeah, Can Scotty tells Kirk that they're there and Kirk says, yeah, get them to go to medical. So that is where we are, down in medicine or medical. Sick bay. Sick bay dispensary. McCoy looks over them and confirms that they are fine, although Spock's readings would be abnormal if they were human. Yeah, uh, McCoy likes doing this. I think we'll find this more and more. He <laughs> taunts Spock every time he gets an opportunity for his differences. And Kirk, in fairness, he comes back with some banter as well. He's delighted with the fact that his readings are not human. Yeah, I'm not sure that delighted is an emotion that Spock often shows, but it <laughs> certainly seems to be. Can I say at this point, we've heard it a few times previously, 
but I love the the the, the sound of the equipment here. There's this beep, 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 and it reminds me of something that would be in a John Carpenter horror movie. Okay, it's very suspenseful, and you can I can definitely see it being in that that situation. I like it. Yeah. Did you like the rattle sound effect we got every time there's sweaty palms going around? Not really, no. It was maybe a bit overdone, I thought. It was, because you're thinking of a rattlesnake. It's like an audience crutch. It's like, oh, something bad's happening. But yeah. then every time, it's like, oh, here we go again. Yeah. Here we go again. It's like, you know, we've, we've picked up on the thread. Yeah, it's not, yeah, I mean, it's not even... I agree with that, but it's not even just that. It's the fact that they used the rattlesnake sound. They could have yeah. invented something electronic, something out of this world. But they use a, an old school earth noise and yeah yeah anyhow we see turmoil and will get this rattling sound rubbing his arm which looks a bit sweaty or itchy or something and he's shook as they would say he's upset about man being in space now yeah him and kirk get a bit sort of philosophical about the roles but i agree that it's part of the job and that's why they do it Spock doesn't have any theories, but he's obviously recorded data while they were down on the planet, so he suggests they review the information that he's gathered. Yeah, and as Spock and Kirk exit, a medical assistant of McCoy's, I think her name is Christine, she appears with the lab status report, and off to the side, Tormelin continues to show signs of discomfort, which are now joined by this rattlesnake. Yeah, it's ominous. Yeah. But a bit obvious. Very much so. Where do we head next? The briefing room. Yeah. Rand joins McCoy, Scotty and Spock with Kirk as they review the audiovisual tapes. Almost as though they were irrational, drugged. An engineer sitting there apparently oblivious to everything, a woman strangled, a crewman with a phaser pistol in his hand. He'd used the computer room as if it were an amusement gallery. And a fully clothed man frozen to death in a shower. If the image wasn't so ugly, it'd be laughable. Not even a theory, gentlemen? Definitely not drugs or intoxication. The bioanalysis on the tapes proved that conclusively. Could be some form of space madness we've never heard of. But it would have to be caused by something. Our spectral readings showed no contamination, no unusual elements present. But at least none your tricorders could register. Instruments register only those things they're designed to register. Space still contains infinite unknowns. Earth science needs the closest possible measurement of the breakup of this planet. To do this, we need the Enterprise in a critically tight orbit. Question. Could what happened down there to those people create any unusual danger to this vessel and crew? We will need top efficiency, Captain. It'll be a tricky orbit. When a planet begins to go, there may be drastic changes in gravity, mass, magnetic field. The purpose of a briefing, gentlemen, is to get me answers based on your abilities and experience. In a critical orbit, there's no time for surprise. Unless you people on the bridge start taking showers with your clothes on, my engines can pull us out of anything. We'll be warping out of orbit within a half second of getting your command. Bridge to captain. Before we get to the message from the bridge there, I liked Spock's made-up medical conditions of space madness. Yeah, it's a catch-all. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It reminds me of back in uh, some of the Sherlock Holmes books, people would have brain fever. You see it quite well if you watch any of those genealogy programs on TV, the causes of death are all, and they need to be translated to, although well, this was syphilis or this was yeah. whatever else it was, but they're just listed as, you know, madness of the oh, tongue the or groin. something like that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the message that we heard coming through from the bridge there is that there has been a sudden shift in the planet's magnetic field. The destruction of it is beginning. Yes, Spock says those exact words. Does he? It's beginning. Ah. It's ominous again. That's where I got that from then. Almost certainly. I thought it was being creative. No. We're in the rec room. Tormelin gets his dinner from a hatch. Yeah, I think it's malfunctioning. So steam comes out of the hatch when he, his food appears. Uh. Did you see the folk playing 3D um, knots and crosses? Because they obviously aren't ready for the 3D chess. I didn't see that now, really. Yeah. That's good. But he immediately starts wiping his hand on his chest as whatever he has is clearly getting worse. Sulu and Riley show up. Yes, he is trying to get Riley interested in fencing. Yeah. There's some imp implication that Tormolan fences or has fenced with him in the past. Yeah. Because he asks for his contribution, but he snaps at Sulu and tells him he doesn't have to answer to him. Yes, 
He doesn't have pointy ears or outrank him. And this gets the attention of the rest of the crew in the room. They all look up. Yeah, he becomes increasingly irrational and agitated before grabbing a very blunt knife. Yeah, I mean, before that, there's a message for all duty personnel to report to the bridge as Sully gets up to ask Termelon if he's okay. So they're standing at this point. Yeah. And right, uh, Termelon, what does he do? He grabs a... It's barely more than a butter knife. You can still do a bit of damage with that. It's not got a point. A jam knife, you might say, and I'll get to that in a second. Dinner knife. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yes, the others try to take the knife, or certainly Riley and Sulu try to take the knife from him. Yeah, but again, he we should say that what he's ranting about, man's impact. Yeah, the same thing he started on in Sickbay. They shouldn't be there, they're just... They're destroying space. They are. ruining it for everybody else. And he directs this knife at himself at this point, and claims he doesn't deserve to live after the death of the six people on the, the six crew on the, on the planet. And there follows a, a wrestling match, as yeah, you Yeah, I mean, they're, they're not wanting to hurt him, so they're trying to disarm him without causing him any damage, but they do the opposite. Yeah, it results with him being stabbed in the stomach. And it looks more like uh, when my kids eat, or when they were younger even, <laughs> when they ate some jam, or if you're American, jelly sandwiches, and uh, you get a little bit of mess all over your His blood was quite purple. Yeah, it didn't look. There was no, there was rip. no, there was no, yeah, there was no damage to his shirt. He stabbed no. himself through his shirt without damaging it. A little bit of raspberry or maybe black currant jam has been spread over on his hand. Yeah, that the makeup team need to work harder. They do. Those I effects were appalling. The budget's not. I don't know whether fake blood hadn't been invented. Well, it might be that they were not allowed to be too realistic. Well, that's it. Yes, it could be that if you show something that looks too much like blood, do you lose your time slot or something like that? You yeah. can't show it a certain. So that's possibly one reason that we would it would be an obviously fantastic injury rather mm. than a realistic one. In any case, Riley calls for medics and after he does we see him wipe his hand and look at it in the same way that Tormelon has been doing. Oh no. He's in trouble. Not Riley. Yeah. We've known him for four or five minutes now. Riley reminds me facially of Roddy McDowell when he was younger, especially in Colombo. Mm -hmm. If you remember the exploding cigar case. Yes. Yeah. With these very tight trousers. Short fuse. Mm, you might say that. His trousers <laughs> would indicate otherwise. <laughs> Anyhow. We do have a Columbo connection this week, we'll come back to that later on. Hopefully, yeah. We get a, for the, is this the first time, a supplemental captain's log? Well, it's a, it's a, yeah, they calls it supplemental, he calls them different things all the time. I think it's really up to him, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> he writes it a few weeks after it's happened. Yeah, yeah, this is the one we, you talked about where he expresses knowledge that they don't have yet. Yeah, what did he say? He says that the, the crew is being infected by a contagious disease, unknown to us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Logging after the fact. This isn't on. This is me from the future. Try to look all in smart. The past. You're right now. Now, what I suggest it is, it's probably some sort of sort of water based. <laughs> he's, he, what he's doing is he's forgotten to do any notes. He's backdating them. Yeah. <laughs> he's making himself he's look better. Write up your your notes on this one, Kirk. He's like, oh, better make sure I did a note about the virus back at the start. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> up in the bridge. Sai is condensing rapidly, and Spock comments that they may be witnessing. What is in store for the planet Earth in the future, as Sai was similar before its sun went dark? That's quite ominous. Yeah. Put a bit of downer on things here, Spock. He always likes to pick on Earth. Yeah. It's like, your planet's rubbish. Where does he live? When he's not on his on mission? Enterprise. Yeah, when he's not on his mission, will he go back home? Does, does he come, like, his mother was uh, a Vulcan, but does no, he... No, his mother was... A uh, human. human, okay, so his father. Yeah, but uh, he doesn't talk to them. Yeah, so where does he live? He doesn't live anywhere, he works. Yeah, but after this five year mission, when he goes back, where will he go back go to? probably go to a Starfleet facility and work on in an office or something. An office? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Until his next mission. Anyway, as Riley works, we see him rub his arm and we hear the rattling sound again. And worse still, Sulu seems to have the affliction. Yeah, his, his fingertips are a little bit sweaty there. Yeah. Kirk and Spock get to discussing Tormolan. Yes his condition in particular. And Spock tells him that he had the capacity for self-doubt prior to this and that something has brought it to the fore very dramatically. Spock's right. always making these assumptions. I mean, he might well be right, but he jumps right he, in he there. He does it more in this episode. It annoyed me a little bit. He's at least, he thinks this might be the thing and then declares it to be the fact. Yeah. He must be murdered as a solution. <laughs> If he's got so much self-doubt, why doesn't he just kill himself? <laughs> and if he doesn't, I will. <laughs> Spock. Calm it, calm it. Back can, I, can I go and get my big phaser gun? No. We've left that on that other planet, remember? We've written it out of all future scripts. Yeah, that's in Delta <laughs> Vegas, whatever it is yet. Anyhow, 
down in sick bay there's an operation going on um, mccoy's trying to patch up tor mullen's wound yes with some very futuristic equipment and one thing that looks a bit like a hand pump yeah well i think what we might be seeing here are the salt shakers from the man trap ah yeah they've been repurposed okay but in any case he doesn't seem particularly flustered Ever, no, it's a standard uh, procedure there wasn't any ominous threat or anything he's just dealing with it normally back up to the bridge there is a sudden pull from the planet on the enterprise and when riley doesn't immediately compensate for this kirk is forced to do it for him and riley claims that it must have made him nervous and that's not when, you, when you're in this particular position you should be trained for these type of things you can't say oh i was a bit nervous no we're on a five-year mission in space getting around these planets and watching it destruct yeah. you can't claim i do quite like the way though that the imply either that Kirk knows everybody's job and could do any of those jobs if he had to. It's not just a guy who sits in a chair and tells everybody else what to do. No. So that needed done, he did it when it needed done rather than just sitting there barking orders at people. I said earlier I've been watching a lot of, uh, or maybe I didn't, but anyway I've been watching an awful lot of, t one, one episode a night of TJ Hooker. It's on TV here at the moment so I've been recording it and watching it when I get in um, and that's the type of cop he is as well. He's back in the, the beat but he can do every job. Undercover, narcotics, street work, you know, Only competent. Yes, and he gets yeah. involved in everything. It's brilliant. Yeah. Anyway. We quickly nip back down to sickbay where McCoy can't understand why Tormolan isn't responding to the treatment. They try various different things. Chapel, I think, gives him some breathing aids, but he dies. And McCoy notes that his injuries should not have been fatal. Yeah, not too clever there by McCoy. Well, yet to find out the, the reasoning, but he didn't save Tormolan anyway. No. Back up to the bridge and Spock updates Kirk on the deterioration of the planet and the consequences of this on the ship's orbit. He does. McCoy comes on the comms asking for Kirk to come to sickbay but he's not keen to leave the bridge while there's still an emergency. Underway. No, I think it, it's at this point I th he may have called Scotty advising him to be prepared for more power that's going to be needed on demand and he says yeah this isn't a problem. He's very confident I found Scotty. Yeah. He, he thinks he can handle anything. Spock then immediately contradicts himself. You know, seconds ago, the breakup of the planet is imminent, but now it's stable. So <laughs> Kirk can go to sickbay to answer McCoy's he request. Can. And at this point, we see that Sulu is in the grips of the virus as well. And with a cheeky little glint in his eye, he invites Riley for a, a quick workout in the gym to take the edge off it. <laughs> as much as Riley is also ill, he's still incredulous at this suggestion because they're on duty in an emergency and they need top efficiency, as you remember Spock saying earlier on. Indeed. So when Riley declines, Sulu leaves on his own. And we're down at sickbay. Yes, McCoy makes a very unmedical pronouncement that Tormolan didn't want to live and that he gave up and is immediately called out by Kirk for this nonsense. But McCoy immediately contradicts himself by saying that that kind of man doesn't give up. Yes. McCoy as I think it's more frustration. He's expressing his frustration. He's not really saying what he means initially. But he's got a death in his hands and he doesn't know why. So he's yeah. just flip-flopping. He doesn't want blamed. He gave up. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> he didn't give up. That's medical nonsense. It's a bit like in one of the Star Wars films, one of the main characters just dies of sadness. Spoiler. Yeah. Well, I didn't see who. Okay. And it's a movie that's about 20 years old, so. Spock. Yeah, one of them. Anyway, yes, uh, Kirk wants to know if there's any possibility that this could be connected to the trip to the planet and whether there's any risk to the rest of the crew. McCoy's under pressure at this point, so he is not sure what type of answer to give. He says he has done everything possible to check that it wasn't because of their, their visit to this uh, planet. But that's not good enough for Kirk. He wants the impossible as well. Well, he doesn't want to do anything impossible. He wants him to check impossible options. So things that McCoy's ruled out without checking, mm. check it. Back up at the bridge. There is another emergency as the planet again suddenly increases its pull and Spock demands to know where Sulu is. Yeah, he snuck off when Spock wasn't looking, so he's stunned to realise that the station is unmanned. Yeah, he puts... Uh, somebody called Rand, so presumably Janice's husband or brother. Obviously. And then he gets an unusual response from O'Reilly. Yes, he lapses into a bad case of full-blown Irishness. Yeah. Pretend Irishness. Yeah, faux sort of pub. Eighth generation ago came from Ireland sort of thing, yeah. He says, have no fear, O'Reilly's here. And he's worth 10,000 of him. Makes no sense. Doesn't make any sense at all. 
Spock has Uhura come down to take the, the con from Riley, who commends Spock's commitment to universal suffrage and women's work. Yes. Yeah, so he's not only turned Irish, he's turned into a 19th century Irishman. <laughs> and uh, jauntily heads down to sickbay where Spock has ordered him to go. Yes. And that's where we are. Christine confirms that Tormelin is dead. Uh, to Riley, yes. Yeah. But rather than show an appropriate emotion, he touches her face and tells her that she's lovely eyes as we hear the rattle again. Yeah, I think she is a bit sympathetic to the fact that his friends died and maybe thinks he's in shock. Yeah, if you're being generous, I think she maybe gives him the benefit or she feels so uncomfortable that her natural reaction is to pretend to give him the benefit of the doubt. I think she's trying to justify it to herself. Yeah, there were some dated looking props in this scene. Did you see the sprays on the table that were just like those big sort of water sprays you use for flowers? Didn't notice, no. Yeah, it six of them with pink liquids in them. <laughs> but Riley continues his inappropriate behaviour by getting closer to her and informing her that his friend's mistake was simply not being Irish before winking at her and floating back out the door. I think I saw this scene in Leprechaun 4. <laughs> Is that Leprechaun in space or the hood? In space, obviously. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and with him left, we now see her rub her face and her hands. That doesn't bode well. Yeah, we then go to one of the most iconic scenes in Star Trek history. Yeah, watching it for the first time, I was still aware that this probably would be an <laughs> iconic scene. You've got an oiled up Sulu, stripped yeah. to the waist. Um, the actor apparently putting in a bit of extra gym work in advance of this when he was told it was required. He's in fine shape. Absolutely. He's brandishing a, a sword, a fencing sword. We heard him talking to Riley about fencing earlier on, didn't we? Yes. He issues a challenge to Cardinal Richelieu, whether it's the, the real Cardinal Richelieu or the fictional Dumas version. Doesn't I'm really sure. matter. No. Uh, anyway, he... he appears to think he's a 17th century Frenchman. And chases a couple of randoms away before heading up the stairs towards the bridge. He also tests his own sword for sharpness. Yeah, and pricks his finger a little bit. Yeah. Sharper than they thought. Falls into a hundred years sleep. Up on the bridge, Kirk enters and relieves Spock of command as they discuss the current predicament that they find themselves in. What were their symptoms? Not violent at this stage. Slightly disoriented, Riley seemed rather pleased with himself, as if he were... Irrational. Or... drugged. Precisely. Security, Lieutenant Uhura. Yes, sir. Both Sulu and Riley, locate and confine. I want every crewman who comes in contact with them medically checked. Sir, level two, corridor three reports a disturbance. Mr. Sulu chasing crewman... with a sword. Put security on it. Fascinating. A pattern is developing. First, Tormolin, hidden personality traits being forced to the surface. Then Riley, who fancies himself a descendant of Irish kings. And now Sulu, who is at heart a swashbuckler out of your 18th century. Present condition of side 2000. Gravity full increasing. We've shifted 2% and should stabilize our position. Helms will stabilize position. Helm is not answering to control. Warp us out of here. No response from engine, sir. Impulse power, then. Blast us out of this orbit. Impulse engine's also dead, sir. Engine room, we need power. Mr. Scott, acknowledge. Our controls are dead. I have an issue with Spock's proclamations here. It's the usual Spock leaping. Yeah, he's not got a record anywhere that says that Riley fancies himself as a descendant of Irish kings. No, I'm sure that wasn't on his CV or his application form for and this he, mission. He's a hundred years out with Sulu, clearly a 17th century swashbuckler, not an 18th century. Is it 17th century? Yeah, Sulu was around in the 1600s. Yeah. Yep. Amazing what you can find out on Wikipedia. And the Three Musketeers was written in the 19th century about, yeah, or yeah, it's, it's, it's wrong. Spock is stupid. Well, it's not so much stupid as the fact he just declares this as fact. Mm -hmm. It's irritating. So with no answer from Scotty, Kirk goes to investigate, but is met at the door by the energetic Sulu, who challenges him for honour, Queen and France. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine this? Kirk's like, we're in deep trouble here, we're about to crash into the atmosphere of a planet, we're all going to be dead, and then I've got this to put up with as well, him prancing around with his top off. He gets pricked by Sulu's blade as well. Does he? Yeah, but after Uhura distracts 
Sulu. Kirk is able to disarm him and Spock delivers a, I think the first of the series, a Vulcan nerve pinch to the, the crewman. Is that the Vulcan first, way. yeah? Yeah. I think Kirk says that he needs to be taught that sometime. Yes. And Spock says that um, they should take this D'Artagnan out of here. So that's a bit out of character for him to call him D'Artagnan. Is that an emotional response? Does that mean he's been infected? Mm, no, I think he's just been sarcastic. He's it's irritated. Irritated, him. yeah. And struggling to hide it. Mm hmm. So they send Sulu to sickbay and Kirk again tries to get hold of Scotty. However, he's surprised to hear Riley coming from engineering, yes. Yeah, who has now taken on the role of captain and is ordering ice cream from the engine room. I like this next bit. So Kirk tries to leave, but the lift's busy. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not sure. Is this just that they messed it up and he's improvised in character, asking Uhura to fit free it up, or was it scripted? That the lift wouldn't be available for him at this stage. I'm sure a, a Trekkie can let us know. There's a bit earlier on in Sickbay as well where I thought it sounded like one of them had forgotten a line mm -hmm. and they just kind of carried on in character. Yeah, I could be wrong, but that was the impression I got. Things get worse as Riley starts on, for the first time, on his terrible rendition of I'll Take You Home Again, Kathleen, and Spock tells Kirk that they are only 20 minutes away from burning up in the planet's atmosphere unless they get some power sorted. That might be a relief if this guy keeps singing. Yeah, to have him burned up. Yeah. Yeah. It's better than listening to that song one mm -hmm. more time. It wasn't even a nice rendition of it. It was a terrible rendition of it. not a good song to start with. Nah. Dirge. Yeah. Captain's Log 1704.4. Another recap of what we already yeah, know. Yeah, I've just noted Kirk recaps the situation for anyone who dozed off for the last five minutes. We're in the corridor at the engine room. <laughs> I, I love this. I've just written down the four lines that I've, I've written. Good work, Scotty. <laughs> because what has happened to Scotty is the most slapstick thing that you can imagine. Tell us. A crazy Irish crewman run in and said, Oh, the captain needs you. So Scotty and all his crew have run out the door <laughs> and he's locked it behind them. <laughs> Yeah, after this is uh, sorted, I think Kirk has to have a word with Scotty. Yeah, don't go running out of engineering. <laughs> Just because. <laughs> anyway, ah. we find out that the only way to get into the engine room is to cut through the, the wall circuits in the bulkhead yes. or whatever it is, whilst Riley continues his singing inside. Yeah. We head back up to the bridge. Ahura reports more breakouts of crew infighting to Spock, who orders lots of the main sections to be sealed off to try and minimise the spread of this virus. Yeah, he also tries to sound an alert, but Riley intervenes to stop it. He does. Not just to stop it, but with a, an announcement of his own. There will be a formal dance in the bowling alley. So, we've got a bowling alley on well, the Enterprise. I'm not sure we can be sure of that. He could just be crazy. Doesn't seem crazy to me. There might be a bowling alley. It would make sense. It's well, somewhere to recreationally spend yeah, time. I'm not sure if it would make sense. A bowling alley. It's not really multi- purpose is it? Depends how many lanes there are. What else are you going to do with it? You can't if they're all Formal dance. Yeah, you'd have to put something over the top then. Because they've got yeah. gutter, gutters on each. There are lots, so you'd have yeah. to... Yeah. If I was building a, a, a ship for a five-year mission... It's not the most efficient use of space. I would be having a bowling alley. Or maybe there isn't one. It could be in his head. Yeah. Who knows? Although I believe that there was eventually a diagram produced for a Star Trek Blueprints book. Oh, I'm sure. That showed a bowling alley on the <laughs> Enterprise. Also Scotty's office that he's just mentioned in the previous scene. Uh, in any case, there are now 17 minutes left and at this, the ship is jolted once more. And I think this is maybe the first time we've seen this trope which has been uh, taken off by uh, many skits and, and shows over they the throw years. they themselves around. Yeah, obviously they just, yeah. I quite like the fact that McCoy just contacts the bridge to say, stop it. Yeah. He didn't like getting shaken around when he was doing his uh, tests on Sulu. Yeah, he asked for things to be kept still. It's like, yeah, we weren't doing it on purpose. Yeah. There's obviously a reason for it, McCoy. And with your recent record, you've got, I'd be keeping my head down if I were you. Yeah. He is running a test on Sulu, which so far, or tests, which have so far revealed nothing unusual. And he won't be able to offer a solution to Riley until they produce something else. It's quite an ominous use of the word solution. We need a solution for Riley. We need to deal with him medically. Yeah. Spock's, ah, listen, I've got a solution for him. <laughs> No. <laughs> it's a, it's a no, put the phaser rifle away again. <laughs> Riley comes on comms with some sexist requirements. Yes, he's got advice for how women should dress and, and make up. They have to wear their hair down and not overdo it in the makeup. There's nothing worse than a, an over made up woman. It's going to be 
very difficult for him to spend time with his female crewmates if he survives this. Yeah, because I think we find out later that these are, you know, the, the actual thoughts that are just like with, with, with alcohol. Yeah. That your, your real thoughts sort of get brought to the surface, maybe magnified a little bit, but still, they're in there somewhere. So Sulu really thinks that Kirk's Richelieu? Yeah. Okay. And he again breaks into a verse of, of Kathleen. This gets as annoying as I saw the light from Columbo's swan song. That was bad. Terrible. In the corridor we see Scotty contacting the bridge. He's made some changes through the wall so they can fly the ship slightly. Yeah, yeah we see Scotty before that play some jumper devices strategically. Yeah, just to get it all yeah. wired together. Up on the bridge... Kirk sends Spock firstly to help Scotty and then when he's done with that to go to sickbay. Check what's going on there. They've only got 16 minutes left at this point. Yeah, they should have a wee clock in the corner just counting down. I think as well in this scene Ahura complains that there are further outbreaks of disorder on board but she can't communicate with sickbay as Riley keeps changing the channels and yeah, frequencies. <laughs> that's why Spock's to go there once he's finished with Scotty. On his way Spock comes across Janice and she's being harassed by another crewman who's preventing her from getting to the bridge. I think Moody his name is. Yes. He also notes uh, or notices that somebody has a dubbed Love Mankind on the wall. Isn't that the worst? Spock arrives at engineering or outside engineering where he tells Scotty he's not working hard enough. Yes. What he does is he wastes Scotty's time by telling him that he has no time to waste. Yes. <laughs> it reminded me of uh, Faulty Towers where yeah, Sybil's Sybil. off sick and she phones Basil to tell him to do these chores which he's in the middle of doing yeah. Yeah. so he takes about 90 seconds to tell Scotty he's now going to be 90 seconds late <laughs> yes and Spock says he has to <laughs> do away with health and safety it's gone mad <laughs> we're down in the sick bay where McCoy is still testing the unconscious Sulu with the help of Christine but leaves for the biopsy lab when he can't get them on communications. Yes, and at this point, Nurse Chapel notes her own symptoms, the sweaty palms and whatever else. Yeah, we see Sulu start to stir, and it becomes obvious that, as you mentioned, Christine is now infected or affected by the virus. And she seems also to have a, a, a glint in her eye, that something has changed in her. You think? Oh, yeah. Okay. Might be a leap. <laughs> oh, no, you can tell. Up on the bridge. Kirk has another crewman removed who's acting up before Janice finally arrives, apologising for having been held up. Yeah, and we see Ahura and Kirk snap at each other. We do, because he tells her to stop the singing coming through and she says, you know, do you not think I'd have done it if I could? Yeah. And then they both apologise to one another. Well, I think they both realise that they're being affected and they're not acting normally or appropriately and they sort of apologise without... Yeah. Making a big deal of it. Kirk gets hold of Scotty and they note that they need between two and three of the 12 remaining minutes to get the engines fired up. Yeah. <laughs> Back down in sick bay, Spock enters looking for McCoy but gets more than he bargained for from Christine. Mr. Spock. Mr. Spock. The men from Vulcan treat their women strangely. At least... People say that, but you're part human too. I know you don't. You couldn't hurt me, would you? I'm in love with you, Mr. Spark. Mr. Spock. The Vulcan, Mr. Spock. Nurse. Christine, please. I see things, how honest you are. I know how you feel. You hide it. But you do have feeling. Oh, how we must hurt you, torture you. I'm in control of my emotions. The others believe that I don't. No, I love you. 
I don't know why, but I love you. I do love you. Just as you are. Oh, I love you. Sorry. Captain is en route engineering, Mr. Spock. Can you take the bridge? Acknowledge. I am sorry. Christine. Spock, I think, must have been infected by the crewman that was harassing Janice because he's at the developing symptoms stage already. He is. That was quite an interesting scene there. Yeah, I wonder how much his um, true feelings being borne out for Nurse Chapel and how much of it is the illness is exaggerating things. Yeah. I also liked her backhanded compliment when I think she says that she loves him. She doesn't know why. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've got a terrible personality and looks up, up to everything. You've never looked at me twice. <laughs> Apparently Leonard and Moy said after this episode his fan mail multiplied by thousands of percent. From whom? Like from women watching the show. Oh right, okay. Became a bit of a sex symbol, did he? Well, did you find that watching this episode? Were you strangely attracted to Spock? Well, he's got a charisma, that's for sure. More so than before this episode? Eh... Uh... He showed a bit of vulnerability, you know, he mm. needed someone to look after him. What I would say is that I think that it's maybe too early in the run for that. I don't know him well enough to yep. appreciate a, a change. I, think been, I mentioned that in previous episodes that when you do an episode like this and you show differences without having really established the standard or the norm, yeah. it, it takes away from it a little bit. Sure. Anyhow, Spock is clearly struggling with how to handle this situation because he's getting emotional. Yes, he leaves after having a good hand fondling from Christine and outside he is severely shaken by the encounter. So much so that he is unable to fully compose himself and has to fight back tears. Back outside engineering, Kirk has showed up and he and Scotty are preparing an assault on engineering which takes about five seconds. Yeah, they get in there, they've got some other crewmen with them and their phasers are set to stun. But he puts up no fight and security escort him out fairly easily, very easily. Meanwhile in the briefing room Spock is hiding himself away to break down. Yes, he sobs, we heard a little bit of that at the top of the podcast. He talks about his emotions, his position and his duty and he does this uh, counting two, four, six. I wonder if it's a trick that he's used to control his emotions as a child or something like that. Could be, yeah. Already starting that song. Oh. Two, four. Oh, there are a couple of songs, isn't there? Two, four, six, eight. It's never too late. Or the other Who do one. We appreciate? appreciate. <laughs> or uh, me. <laughs> two, four. Was it three times a lady? <laughs> anyway, back in the engine room. After getting a message from the bridge that they are entering the planet's atmosphere or about to, which is bad news. Scotty gives Kirk worst news. What the is, worst news. Yeah. What's Riley done? He's turned off all the engines completely. <laughs> Utterly cold. <laughs> so they don't have time to turn them back on. They're as cold as dinner. Yeah. A and fridge. The engines run based on an antimatter reaction, which is quite volatile. So you can't just press a button and they fire up. Yeah, it's going to take 30 minutes to get them back up to speed. And even Scotty can't change the laws of physics, he explains. That'll come to be a catchphrase. Will it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's 30 minutes to get up to speed, but there are only 8 minutes left. Da, da, da. And in case you missed the last few minutes, Kirk recaps it in a handy captain's log. Uh, yeah, a little supplemental. I think sometimes they're used just to split the same scene. It's like a, cut, a cutaway because, yeah. Time has passed. Exactly. So we're still in the engine room. Scotty and Kirk give us some scientific gobbledygook about mixing matter and antimatter. I don't know. babble. Yeah, exactly. Kirk thinks they can create a controlled implosion, but Scotty points out that it, that is only theory and it gives it an odds of success, I think 10,000 to 1, and only then if they'd enough computer power. Yeah, which they don't. No. However, during this, Kirk communicates with the bridge to find that Spock isn't there. Mm. He doesn't know when, where any of his crew are. In no. desperate times, he can't get a hold of anyone. There's an illness spreading throughout the ship, to be fair. Yeah, that's true. But not for long, because McCoy's got a cure. Yeah, we're down in sick bay. We see Sulu yelling in pain from, I think it's an injection, administered by McCoy. Yep. It does the trick. He is instantly cured of this virus. So, McCoy attempts to communicate with the biolab, 
letting them know that they or he has found the answer and to prepare a larger batch of this serum. He's not. I'm not sure why he keeps trying when the guy just laughs in his <laughs> ear. <Yeah. laughs> so, okay, if I just say it loud enough, <laughs> you'll definitely do it. You would immediately understand that there's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> It, he explains that the, the ice planet, or Psi 2000, whatever it's called, had converted water into a complex chain of molecules. Does yeah. this stand up to rigorous scientific Mag consideration? MacGuffin. It reminds me a bit of our Doctor Who episode called The Water of Mars. Okay. Where the water kind of came alive and killed everybody. Yeah. Yeah, what we find out is this virus is spread via perspiration. Yeah. And just basically makes people drunk. Yeah. Suppresses Actually, their judgment. It yeah. doesn't change them. No. Interesting. These days they would adapt it into a drug. People would be taking it. Yeah. You know, for a hit. Yeah, sigh water. Yeah. I'm sure you can get that. So. Come on, you can get that brandy. I'm sure people are selling sigh water. Oh, you never know. All right, good dunt. Up in the briefing room. Yeah, well, we should say that uh, McCoy ends up having to go to the lab himself. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> briefing room, yeah. What happens up there? Well, Spock is discovered by Kirk in the middle of his breakdown. Yes, he opens his heart about how he could never tell his mother that he loved her. And how he feels shame at being friendly towards Kirk. So Kirk feels that he's no option but to do again his naked gun-esque slaps to yeah. try and get Spock to pull himself together. He tries to punch the infection out of him, which is not medically sound procedure. No, and Spock easily stops his hand and holds it firmly while Kirk pleads with him to help. Things escalate as Spock continues to talk about his lifetime of hiding his feelings and when Kirk tries to take another slap, he retaliates and knocks him over the table to the floor. Quite like that. It was good. You can see that Spock is the stronger man. This doesn't dissuade Kirk, although his attitude changes very quickly and we discover more about his true feelings. We've got to risk implosion, it's our only chance. It's never been done. Don't tell me that again, science officer. It's a theory. It's possible. We may go up into the biggest ball of fire since the last sun on these parts exploded, but we've got to take that one in 10,000 chance. Bridge to Captain. Engineer asked, did you find... Yes, I found Mr. Spock. I'm talking to Mr. Spock, you understand? Yes, sir. Three and a half minutes left, Captain. I've got it. The disease. Love. You're better off without it, and I'm better off without mine. This vessel. I give. She takes. She won't permit me my life. I've got to live hers. Jim. I have a beautiful young. Have you noticed her, Mr. Spock? You're allowed to notice her. The captain's not permitted. Jim. There is an intermixed formula. I know why. It's called she. It's never been tested. It's a theoretical relationship between time and antimatter. Flesh woman to touch, to hold, a beach to walk on. A few days, no braid on my shoulder. Captain. Scotty. That was Shatner going for his Emmy. Full Shakespearean. I think this episode won a Hugo. I don't think he got any Emmys though. <laughs> All of them trying. He does try, doesn't he? He goes for it. Gives it his heart and soul. It's good to see. Yeah, it's full Hamlet. Full Ham, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was enjoyable. At this, Spock tells Scotty to stand by for the intermix and communications is received, updating them on their perilous position. Kirk heads to the bridge. He does. I think he just about manages to keep a, a, a grip on himself. Barely. Mm -hmm. And instructs Spock to clear the corridors and turbo lift in preparation for what's about to be attempted. So everyone man their stations. Don't be in the lift. It's like a fire. You can't be in the lift when there's a fire. Yeah. As Kirk arrives on the bridge, McCoy rips the arm off his shirt and injects him with the cure. He doesn't take anyone else's clothes off though, he just injects them through their clothes. I don't know why he felt the need to 
to rip Kirk's shirt off. No, but you missed a point a bit here. In the lift, the turbo lift, uh-huh. Kirk is disturbed to see the words Sinner, repent, scrolled in the door. Okay. We'll come back to the graffiti after we finish the episode. I've got a trivia point. Have you? Good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So he gets injected. Yep, so that's him fixed. He is. And he then instigates a hyperbolic course in the direction from which they came. Yes, Scotty and Spock are monitoring the engines, but Kirk still seems a little bit away with it. Yes, we get a, a moment of a personal insight, I suppose, here, as we see him glance longingly at Rand, and that's the, the female Rand, as he utters the, the no beach to walk on that we heard him talk about earlier. Yeah. And he goes to reach out to her as if to, to touch her. Inappropriate. Mm, yeah. And she, at the last, she glances, catches him out of the corner of her eye and is confused. I wonder if there's feelings between her and him. Well, obviously, there is between him and her. She's only got another few episodes in the camera. Oh, come on, don't spoil it. I told you the first time she showed up, she's only in eight episodes. Anyway, down in engineering, Spock orders an immediate temperature change. Yes. Kirk gives the order to engage and then we get some great acting from everybody. Yeah, it's not brilliant, is it? They all throw their heads back as if in agony. <laughs> uh, yeah, as the, the, the process is enacted. Only lasts a few moments, though, and it has been a success. Although they discover they are travelling faster than possible for normal space. <laughs> I like the fact McCoy interjects, you'd say, well, we've cured the illness. <laughs> you know, I, I did my bit. <laughs> and they find out that they're actually going backwards in time through a, a time warp. That's handy. And well, they, Kirk takes a jump to the left here. Yeah, very good. And they have to reverse power until things are, are balanced out again. Yes, so he takes a step to the right. And then... <laughs> yeah, we got it the first time. He, he finds out what's going yeah. on. Yeah, Kirk asks Spock what's happened and he tells him that they have regressed in time to three days ago. So they've got three days in the bank that they can relive. They never mentioned this was a possibility of the theory. No. <laughs> it's like, we're going, to, we're going to get out of here within you. Oh, we've come back in time. <laughs> and Spock, we've, we've discovered time yeah, travel. That's, I've, that's what I've noticed here. Spock claims it opens intriguing prospects as they can now go back in time. Yeah, intriguing for the scriptwriters. They've now yeah. got a get out. For everything. For everything. Anything. They could, they could kill the entire crew and then just use their... Back a few days. Yep. Yes, they can go back in time, but Kirk doesn't really seem that keen to do it. No, maybe one day, but not just now. It reminds me of the Superman movie, the first one, right. where he rever- lowers the earth yeah, and reverses yeah. it. And it's like, it sort of undermines everything else because you know that no matter what happens, you, you can just, just reverse time. Yeah. A bit lazy to be, mm, it's not. I wonder though if this has been done as a setup rather than as a get out. So they want to set up a future episode maybe. Yeah. By saying, rather than just having it announced at the start of an episode or having to waste half an episode discovering time travel. We'll just put it in the last couple of minutes of this yeah. one. You remember that time you invented <laughs> you remember the time travel? <laughs> Let's do it. Anyway, yes. Kirk sets it aside for now. And that's it, basically. The only place they're going now is their next destination. Yeah, but there's no discussion of what happened to the planet. Did they go back through this? Did they have to go back and watch it implode again? Will they still be there? The original version? Yeah. Is it gone? Is the planet still dead? I mean, nah, I don't care. That's it, guys. <laughs> Nothing to see here. <laughs> That's all, folks. <laughs> do, 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 do. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a, a fun episode. It was enjoyable. There were certainly moments of, yeah, really quite comedic scenes, especially starring uh, Sulu. Yeah. Uh, and there was some nice character development, some nice insight into just what Spock actually thinks. We see more emotion from Kirk as well. We know yeah. that he's not just a captain, he's a man. It was good to have McCoy back and everyone in their own jumpers. Mm-hmm. Discovered a little bit more about Scotty. He's quite a confident chap. It's a uh, terrible haircut. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, none of them have got good haircuts. His is particularly bad. Yeah. Like it's all combed forward from behind the top of his head. You're not suggesting. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's interesting. I thought that despite the fact that the prime driver of the episode is this virus, it was cured off screen in about a minute. Yeah. Without any discussion of what it was or how it could, you know, it's just like a one liner from McCoy. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's the water. Oh, I've cured it. Yeah. Here's an injection. Well, that, that, yeah, that in itself was just a MacGuffin, wasn't it? It was just yeah. to create tension and allow us to have Sulu with his top off. Yeah. Yeah, but I think the biggest takeaways from the episode are the way that we addressed Spock's dual identity and the way he struggles with it. And also 
Kirk in the same sort of way, this sort of dual track, you know, he has love for the ship, but also the way that it restricts him personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it was an episode, unlike where No Man has gone before, it was an episode that advanced the show. Yeah, definitely. We're starting to see them as more fleshed out characters now. Yeah. Okay. Right, before we wrap things up, Ian, give us some trivia. Okay, original air date, 29th of September 1966, seven days after the previous episode. Directed by Mark Daniels, you've heard his name before. That was the father of Paul Daniels, I believe. No, he directed The Man Trap. This ah. is the second of his 15 Star Treks. You'll like it. Not a lot. The episode was written by John D.F. Black, who got a story credit when they, they ripped this off in The Next Generation for an episode called The Naked Now. And he wrote a second Next Generation episode, but under a pseudonym. Uh, he was called Ralph Wills. He was also the main story editor for this entire season of Star Trek. So as well as writing this one episode, he was obviously involved in helping with the story on all the other ones. He also wrote episodes for a number of other TV shows, including Hawaii Five-0 and Murder, She Wrote, and died in 2018 at the age of 85. Good age. Stuart Moss played Joe Tormelin. The first of his two appearances in the show, obviously not as Tormel and he's dead. But, well, we'll see, I guess. Timey wimey. Time, time machine. <laughs> he has appeared in a wide range of programmes over the year, but also including Hawaii Five-0 and Murder, She Wrote. And he died at the age of 79 in 2017. Not so good, but still decent. Bruce Hyde is an interesting one. This is the first of two appearances as Riley. He only has eight acting credits, including a run in Dr. Kildare. And seven of his eight shows took place in 65 and 66. Um, but he's also one of only two people credited on a 2010 film, The Confession of Lee Harvey Oswald. So I'm not sure if that is him or if it's just been put on his IMDb because he's got the same name. You never know. Mm. But he doesn't seem to have done much acting because in 1967 he appeared in a production of Hair as a hippie and immediately quit acting to become an actual hippie. Really? <laughs> he later got into academia, he got a PhD and he was a, a chair at a university, but yeah, he gave up acting to be a hippie. Well done him. As long as he didn't give up acting to become a, a singer. No, he, he died in 2015 from cancer at the age of 74. We've got Majel Barrett, who was later Majel Barrett Roddenberry, played Nurse Chapel. She, is that Christine? Yes. So she, this is the first, well I say the first, she was in the pilot The Cage as a different character. But this is, in theory, the first of her 26 appearances as Nurse Chapel. Okay. Um, she has a far bigger role in Star Trek history. She's the voice of the computer in this series and The Next Generation. And I think for Voyager and maybe Deep Space Nine, parts of Deep Space Nine as well. And she appears as a character called Luxana Troy on both Deep Space Nine and The Next Generation in multiple episodes. And she's our Columbo connection. Okay. She was an uncredited voice in the hospital during a stitching crime, which of course was the episode to feature Leonard Nimoy as yeah. Dr. Barry Mayfield. That's him. Very good episode. Yeah. That's one of the best. Yeah. Especially that party scene. Love it. When he eats his, uh, yeah, stuffs his face. <laughs> yeah. Evil once. Okay. Away from the cast, according to William Shatner's book, Star Trek Memories, there was a big discussion slash fight between Leonard Nimoy and the writer John Black over some plot points written to Spock's character. So the original draft had Spock's breakdown just being him wandering the corridors crying and then some guy comes out spraying graffiti and puts a graffiti moustache on him. <laughs> <laughs> Draws a couple of fake boobs. <laughs> yeah. But Nimoy suggested that they instead play off this duality in his character between his human and his Vulcan side and the writer told him to get lost. So he went straight to Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> And uh, the writer then came back and said, Dad, Daddy tells me I need to discuss this with you. <laughs> so they ended up getting the scene and then the director asked him how he envisioned it being shot and then they changed that. So he had to fight for that as well. <laughs> but ultimately the episode, I think, works on that basis and Nimoy is keen to take the credit for it. Yeah, I think it needed to be, yeah, not overplayed, not played for laughs. Yeah, I think and, this story's in his autobiography as well, uh, I Am Spot maybe, or I am not Spock, one of the two of them. Yeah. Not much other tri trivia, looking at the international titles as we like to do, mostly called it The Naked Time, but the Germans, as you would imagine, focused on the engineering side of things, called it Implosion in der Spirale, Implosion in the Spiral. Mm. The French went for L'Equipage en Folie, The Madness of the Crew, 
That's okay. And the only other one that differed was the Japanese. Always differs. So I might mangle the pronunciation. I think it's Mano Uchibayo. Yeah, that's how you say it. The evil disease in space. Not so good this week. Well, anyway, mm -hmm. that's it. That's our foreign titles. Next time we've got episode five of season one, The Enemy Within. Intriguing. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, you can get us on social media at Trek Podcast all over the place, get us on YouTube. Please come to the website, leave your thoughts on both this episode of Star Trek and the podcast, and we will see you next time. Cheerio. Bye-bye. <laughs>